Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is Jack Zenger. I'm here with my colleague, Joe Folkman, and we are here to talk with you about an exciting new chapter in our, uh, in our careers, uh, the, the launch of the new Extraordinary Leader book, uh, the book that actually got us started and, and, and brought us together for uh, our current uh, business endeavor. Uh, the book is divided into three basic parts, and the, the first is a, is a very similar kind of uh, grouping of, of chapters having to do with overall leadership development, particularly focused on individuals and their, their personal development. Uh, and Joe is going to cover some of the insights uh, in the original book, the earlier editions, there were 20 insights uh, over the past 15 years. We have think we think there are more that we've discovered, and so there are 33 insights that we uh, now include in those first chapters. Uh, the book is is has a new part, uh, which is now focused on the organization's role in making leadership development succeed. Uh, and we've introduced six new chapters uh, that uh, deal with that. And I'll walk through those with you as we move through today's webinar. Part three is uh, an addition of some additional information regarding uh, women and their unique role in the leadership uh, formula, uh, a, a chapter on the importance of measurement uh, and a chapter having to do with teams and, and team development. So that's the big, broad picture uh, of the book. And so we're going to toss the ball to, to Joe and have him talk about those, uh, those first chapters in part one. Boy, Jack, it's great to get the book done, isn't it? <laughs> it surely is. <laughs> Getting it done is not is not fun. People say, "Do you like writing?" And I go, "I like having a book done." Yeah, done. <laughs> I don't like Getting there is really hard. Uh, let me start with this first insight, uh, and it really comes down to why we do leadership development. The reason we do leadership development is we believe there is a correlation between outcomes and leadership effectiveness, and, and that's the point. That, that is the reason we're, we're focused on leadership development, is we know that if you can improve the skills of a leader, you improve their effectiveness, and this first chart shows the results from 66,000 leaders across the globe. And it's looking at leadership effectiveness. It, we've divided people into 20 groups uh, based on their leadership effectiveness from the worst, the, those at the fifth percentile to, to the best, those at the hundredth percentile. And what we're looking at, the bars represent employee engagement. And so what we found is if you work for a bad leader, you have a disengaged employee. If you work for a good leader, people are feeling okay and but if you work for a great leader uh, a leader at the hundredth percentile you love your job and you're more willing to do more and to work harder and to and and you know that's that is a, a, a critical part of what we, we found isn't that a wonder and that makes me salivate. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that is the truth. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it shows it. One of the things that we found that's kind of unique, the more research we've done on this, is that every incremental improvement you come across in terms of a, in terms of a leader has an effect. And so mm -hmm. just getting a little bit better helps. And, and so that's, that's an interesting insight. And if we take that same data and we look at that by software company, oil company, banking, telecom, broadcaster, global pharma, what you see is the same trend. And then I got my favorite group ever, rocket scientists. You know, <laughs> if, if you think about it, if, if you're in software or oil or banking, you know, there's lots of uh, jobs there. There's lots of places you can go, lots of different companies. But if you want to be a rocket scientist, you're kind of limited. Yes. Not a great number of places. There's more now, but, but you're, you're kind of limited. And, and so let's say that you get a job at, at, a, at a great place. You're, you're doing something around 
firing rockets into space and and doing something marvelous and you know this is your dream job you've dreamed of this for your life this is where you want i mean you've spent years in school and doing things and let's say that you work for uh, a really bad leader and what happens is your engagement is around the fifth percentile wow. and and you know when i th i saw that data i thought you know supervisor uh, the effect of that supervisor makes or breaks your dream but if you work for a great leader, your, your engagement's at the 90th percentile, and it is your dream job. And, and so, you know, that just demonstrates that issue of the importance of leadership effectiveness. One of the insights we had is one organization can have many great leaders. And one of the things we've done is looked across time and looked at the percentage of leaders in the top 10%. These are what we call the extraordinary leaders. And, and this is data from one company when, when we first started working with them, they had 9.6% of great leaders, which is what you'd expect. I mean, you'd right. expect 10%. Yeah. Uh, but over time, and, 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 and as we got to do development with more people, this started off kind of small, but it grew and it grew. You can see that at, that in 2011-12, it goes from to 13%, 13, 14 to 18%, and finally 17, 18 to 21%. And, and that, that's the point. Yeah. What we know is, is if we can get an opportunity to do development with leaders, if we can, if we can give them that feedback and help them understand where they're at and what they can do to improve, we can grow the leadership talent in your organization. So that, that's an exciting graph. I love that graph. So. <laughs> uh, another insight, and I'm, we're going to skip through some of these, is, is the impact and, and, and what leaders do to, to, to improve. And what we did a, about a year and a half ago is we decided to replicate our first study that when we started this, and, and when we first did the study, we had about 20,000 leaders, uh, 200,000 assessments. Uh, now, on our current study, we had about 1.5 million assessments and 121,000 leaders. So a lot more data there. And, and what we were looking for was this idea of differentiating competencies. What we, what we found is, you know, a lot of people do 360, and they'll just throw any item in there and they think you know any item is one item is as good as another they're not and we found that there were items that that we had thought were good and i show you the example of his on time to meetings and that, you know actually the poor leaders the worst leaders were better than the the best <laughs> leaders of being on time i guess they had nothing better to do right <laughs> but but that did not differentiate great from poor leaders but what did are these items like does everything possible to reach goals? That had a huge difference between the best and worst yeah. leaders. Yeah. What we found is those items, and, and when we did that analysis, what we found is those 16 competencies that we originally identified in our original research were still differentiating. They worked as well today as they did 15 years ago. But we did find uh, three new competencies that bubbled up. And, and, and as we looked at that data, we found that uh, making decisions, taking risks, and valuing diversities were new competencies. And then we decided that w there were a few competencies that we wanted to add a little more depth to. So uh, we had a competency called Practice of Self-Development, and we, we changed that title to Learning Agility. And, and the second one is the importance of customers and, and customer expectations and experience. And so we changed that one to from uh, dealing with the outside world to, to customer and external focus. So our new model uh, that we highlight in the book, we talk about 19 competencies. And, and uh, you can see the model there, and you can get more information about that. But we think that that provides a better set of... And uh, more up-to-date. Yeah. Very current. It is. Um, another insight that we had is that leadership competencies are linked together. Uh, 
one of the things we kept finding is is that one competency affects another and so if you think of two very different competencies one is drives for results the other is inspires and motivates others and if you look at discretionary effort and that's the percentage of people that are willing to do more and go the extra mile and really work hard if you were good at drive for results that you know if you were actually if you were bad at both of those if you were below the 75th percentile that's not too bad I mean that's below the top quartile uh, your average score at uh, the average percentage of people are willing to go the extra mile is 27 percent but if you if you were high on drive and low on inspires it goes to 42 percent if you're higher on inspires and goes to and, and high on inspires and lows on low on drive it goes to 46 percent but actually, if you're good at both, uh, if you're above the top quartile on both drives and inspires, you get 64% of your employees willing to put in extra effort. And, and what that means is productivity. And what we found from this is this interaction effect between one competency and another. Uh, yeah. you, you know, people sometimes they say, well, you, should I stop pushing and start pulling? Should I stop driving so hard, <laughs> right? And, and start inspiring. We said, no, you should do both. And, and, and because these, these, lead, these, uh, these competencies sort of feed off each other and the one affects the other and you can see that interaction effect there. It's, it, just, it just blows you out. And again, uh, the, we found that leaders who are doing both of those well have, uh, are much better leaders. Uh, Insight 15. Great leaders are not perceived as having any uh, major weaknesses. And the reason I, I put this in is because it's my favorite insight. <laughs> and I remind this to my wife on a vigorous basis. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect. But I mean, you know, one of the, the things that we had when we talked about great leaders is people thought that meant being perfect. They thought they had to be great at everything. And then we said, no, if you were good at three things, you're at the 81st percentile. Five things, you, you hit the 90th, 90th percentile. And, and, and what that means is, is that leaders came in different shapes and sizes. I mean, they, they were different, but they were good at a few things. It, 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 that was the point we made, and you didn't need to be perfect. So that, that's my favorite insight. I had to include that. So <laughs> uh, insight 20, leaders can improve their effectiveness through self-development. And, and again, uh, this is a study we've done, 3,000 leaders, where we looked at pre and post test results. We looked at those people with fatal flaws and found that they started off at the 18th percentile, but after a couple of years, uh, you know, they were able to move to the 46th percentile. Not everyone made the change, but the majority did. Yeah. The majority of people uh, did something with the data, and not everyone does, but, but those that, that, that made an effort to change were able to move and, and, and move from being bad to good. And this is a particularly important message, I think. Uh, people really occasionally will ask, you know, can leaders really change? Can, can they really get better? And uh, this, this is just very, you know, vivid uh, proof of the fact that absolutely, uh, ones who are who work at it and who are you know kind of average can become you know much much higher in their in their performance, and ones who are kind of down down in the lower quartile, uh, if they're willing to kind of be serious and work on those uh, failings, uh, they really can make a, a significant difference. They, uh, they can, and again, the, the the good leaders got into the top quartile, 75th percentile. Yeah. So yeah. they went from okay to, to really top quartile, which is great. Uh -huh. uh, a couple of other insights. We did an article um, and, and uh, we asked the question, is leadership contagious? And, and, and again, that was a blog that we did for HBR. They, I think they, they had a better title. You remember that title? <laughs> I don't the trickle down effect. The trickle down effect. Yeah. I love that. I thought, you know, occasionally yeah. they change our titles and they go, they messed it up. Yeah, but that right. one, they Not did a one. really good job on. What we found is, is that, and, and this really has a lot of implications. Uh, 
I, I ask people, you know, if you work for a bad boss, does that affect you? And they go, no, my, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, if you're, you're going to be a worse leader because your bod, boss is a bad leader. Uh, well, we actually found that, and in, in what we did is we looked at 265 leaders here, and then we looked at their direct reports. And what we found is if, if, if you were a bad leader, uh, the people that work for that leader, their average effectiveness was at the 29th percentile. So it, it was pulled down. And what you see here is if you work for a great leader, the average effectiveness of the direct reports who work for that leader is the 75th percentile. This is this trickle down effect. The implication of this, and this is what you're going to get into, Jack, is the idea that it, you know, if we, we don't do enough development, we don't train enough people, but if you did, you get this whole trickle down effect. You know, if you work for a good leader, you're a better leader. If you work for a bad leader, you're a worse leader. And, and, and if, we can, if we can change that, it has a significant impact on the effectiveness of an organization. Uh, well, and what's more, it impacted the next level below that. We, we, we've got some data around, around that that we talk about. Uh, the other thing uh, that I find amusing is uh, oftentimes I'm, I'm called into companies and, and uh, they kind of sit me down and they say, uh, we, we need you to go fix those people. The other the, those leaders, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I kind of look at them and say, "What about you people?" Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and they they see the problem is those other guys, right? Uh, and I, well, what about you people? What about you men and women here? And and what we found is this this idea when we looked at, you know, this is eleven thousand leaders, seven different organizations. What we saw is this curve. Uh, the top leaders were at the 73rd percentile, the middle at the 58th, and the bottom lower level leaders at the 44th percentile. So this idea that leadership kind of flowed downhill. And then we got our Organization 8 in. And Organization 8, their average effectiveness wasn't at the 73rd. It was at about the 50th, 58th percentile uh, for the top mm -hmm. leader. And I always ask people, so what, what is the middle, what, where's the middle going to go? Are they all... Is it going to be a flat line? Are they also going to be at the 58th? And no, they're not. They're at the 44th, and the third level's at the 38th. And, and this idea that what happens is leadership flows downhill, that the top management in an organization, they, they set the ceiling, they create the bar, and it flows down from there. And, it, it, you know, people say, you mean it's impossible for me to be better than my boss? And isn't it? Well, it's not impossible. But when I look at the data, the probabilities is you're going to be less effective than your boss. D Jack, I'm so excited. You're an amazing leader. Because <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> that means I'm, yeah. I'm going to, you we'll know, approach that a little bit. <laughs> anyway, Jack, talk about this second part of the book okay. and what's going on there. All right, so again, part, part one, we, we think that those of you who are familiar with the earlier editions of the book will find updated information. All the statistics have been brought up to, to date, uh, and we have added uh, uh, 13 more, we think, very helpful insights. Part two of the book, uh, we are extremely excited about. There has been a great deal written of late about what organizations need to do in order to support overall leadership development efforts. Unfortunately, some of those books and articles have been extremely convoluted and very, very you know, comprehensive and making you know, more than 40 recommendations about what the organization specifically needs to do. So what we've done in this part two of the book is to talk about what are the, the six fundamental elements required for the organization to execute well. And uh, on this slide, I'm just gonna kind of lay them all out here for you and then talk with them, uh, talk with, about them uh, one at a time. But, but we believe you can kind of clump them together into some very logical groupings. And we hope that this becomes a good checklist, a good template, a good pathway for any organization to look at and say, Okay, so is my organization doing what it needs to do in order for our leadership development to succeed? Uh, 
the first chapter deals with the importance of tailoring the uh, leadership development to the specific organization. It's not just possible for one organization to copy exactly what some other company has done. Companies have different histories, they have different cultures, they have different leadership styles, they're at different points in time. We think that it's very important for the organization to tailor the development initiatives to themselves. We particularly think that it's important that the strategy of the organization be linked tightly with the leadership development initiatives. Uh, and that doesn't just happen by chance. And we make the point in the book that maybe the surest way to have that occur is for the leadership development uh, team, the, the professionals doing that, that they take the initiative to start with the, the, the organization strategy and then make sure that whatever you're doing follows that. You know, Jack, it's, it's interesting because about 50% of our work that we do with companies is where we've customized, even though we show you our 19 competency model, about 50% of our clients customize that model to fit them specifically, and, and we find that works a little better. We, we think that really help, absolutely helps. Uh, the second chapter has to do with what we think is one of the big issues, and that is um, selecting bold and aspirational objectives, and particularly moving on to uh, enlarging the scope and scale of what we do. Uh, we are frankly very concerned that we, we see organizations who say that, yes, we've got a leadership development uh, program underway. And, and by the way, there's roughly maybe a, a third of, of organizations, that, of large scale organizations that actually have an ongoing leadership development effort. But many times these are you know, involving only 30 or 40 people per year. And we have this very bone deep belief that if organizations are truly going to fill their leadership pipeline, they must involve a much larger percentage uh, of their overall uh, population in order for that pipeline to be filled. Uh, if you consider two alternatives, uh, an organization that has a wide variety of kind of very small, specific uh, programs versus a, a, an organization that has one program that they deliver to a large number of people, we think there's just no question that the program that involves large numbers, that involves, involves multiple layers in the organization, that that, that, that reaching out and increasing the scale and scope uh, makes a huge difference. There is this kind of concept in, 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 the, in the rest of the world about the notion of herd immunity, uh, that a, a, a rancher, a person in agricultural world knows that if you want to have a herd of cattle protected against some you know, disease like mad cow disease, You've got to inoculate and vaccinate, you know, the, the large majority of the herd in order for that to succeed. Uh, you, can't, you can't ignore uh, major portions of the population. Uh, we've seen, you know, in, this, in our recent history, uh, we, we had virtually eradicated smallpox and measles had been virtually eradicated. And then because people became lax and complacent, they didn't get their children immunized. And there have been outbreaks of, of measles, and 168,000 children died last year um, from, from measles. Uh, we, we need to reach out and involve a large percentage of the people in an organization if we're truly going to have an impact on its, on its overall health. Um, Peter Drucker, a person that a lot of us admire very greatly, you know, made the comment that uh, for an organization to really change its culture and to kind of truly impact its future, it needs to reach at least a third and maybe two-thirds of its population. So 
uh, that's the, the the major message of that of that chapter. You know, it, it, we we said uh, in that you know everybody has the right to work for a great boss, and that's kind of the employee bill of rights, isn't, isn't it? That's, it? That's, yeah, yeah. That, that idea that you know, I mean, and and again, you know, what, what we've shown is you if you work for a crappy leader, you, it's terrible. You know, yeah. it doesn't matter that it's a force level supervisor, but. It, Give everybody the right to work for a great boss. I mean, that's the boy Bill rights. Yeah. The other element of this uh, increasing the scope and scale is that we believe that organizations are waiting too long. And so we strongly make the case here that organizations need to kind of consider starting earlier, working with people early in their careers, uh, that we, we see from our statistics that there are as many people who are 55 years of age and older as there are 30 years of age and younger participating in their overall leadership development efforts. And, and when kind of people stop and think about that, they recognize, well, oh my goodness, maybe we're not allocating our resources in exactly the right way. Uh, a third chapter that we, we include in this new section has to do with ways of increasing the level of senior executive support. Um, we, we know from just ex, you know, repeated studies that when people perceive that they have the, the support and involvement of senior executives, that the organization puts forth more energy, they take it more seriously, they apply what they've learned more, more ardently, and uh, if, there, if there's anything that organizations um, need to do to ensure that they have success, it is to ensure that the senior people, uh, in a variety of ways, convey their support uh, for this overall activity. So we, we present a number of suggestions about how that can be done, how you involve senior executives, uh, encourage them to kick off sessions, to attend, to talk about it frequently, uh, to, to really show their enthusiasm for the development effort. We have some data that was uh, done which kind of showed the, the, the relationship between when individual participants feel that their, that their manager, their immediate manager is supportive, what difference does that make in terms of the overall outcome and, and the degree to which the individual actually perceives himself or herself to have improved. And this chart that you see here uh, is, is just a, a quick representation of the fact that when people see that their manager is not very supportive or believe that uh, versus those who, who believe their manager is really supportive, what a difference that makes in terms of the outcome. I remember uh, a class where I sat down with the participant. He felt, you know, he was a little concerned. And I said, what's up? And he said, oh, my manager read me the riot act for coming to this today. <laughs> you know, and I go, Talk about lack of su support. Lack, lack of support. I mean, the manager mm -hmm. said, well, you got better things to do than go to that training uh, program. Yeah, and, oh, and you know, and that really, uh, you can imagine that person's not going to go back and implement much. Mm. The fourth chapter uh, in this part of the book deals with, we think, one more really important issue, and, and that is uh, leadership is ultimately about behavior, and, it's about, and, and leadership development is about improving or changing behavior. And we believe that the, the main message here is one that we need to be using powerful methods that truly have the ability to change how people behave. Uh, and that the passive, kind of more cerebral kinds of activities um, are not going to bring about that, that change. And so the, the entire chapter talks about what are the characteristics or qualities of, of interventions that truly make a difference. And we make a, we, we make a laundry list of some of the things that we believe have been the, the workhorses of leadership development. And we, of course, are very strong advocates of uh, a 360-degree feedback instrument 
if it's applied properly, if it's really utilized effectively, and if it gets translated into a, a, a powerful uh, development experience where the person creates a personal plan. Uh, we're strong advocates of the value of coaching. Uh, there's, a, there's a ton of research around the combination of coaching and other d- development tactics uh, and what that does to the final outcome. We're, we're, we're real devotees of, of si- simulations because they can uh, create an, an environment where decisions get made and people can see the long-term consequences of their decisions. Uh, we know the power of, of the use of behavior modeling as a way of getting individuals to practice and rehearse a new behavior. And, and people can become better at interviewing. They can become better at giving presentations. If you teach them the right principles, give them a chance to practice and get feedback on whether they have indeed absorbed and, and are now being able to behave in, in new and, and more powerful ways. And, and the, the fundamental elements of these powerful methods are that they are that they're visceral, that, that, they, that they are really kind of touching the, the person's emotions. Uh, and very often they kind of re- create an environment where the, the team is exposed to those same uh, concepts and ideas so that you're practicing it as a system rather than as an individual um, kind of alone in a a different group. Uh, The the fifth chapter of this this part kind of talks about the importance of embedding the the fundamental principles, the capabilities, the competencies that we're teaching in our leadership development initiatives um, and building those into into the culture. We have some clients where we've seen them take those competencies and bake them into recruitment, to selection, to their onboarding activities, to their performance management systems, to the compensation system, and to uh, pl- the, the promotion and, and, and system. What a difference that makes. So chapter, this fifth chapter is all about how you kind of embed these in the system. Yeah, if the, if the, the only time you see that competency model is when you go to leadership development, you kind of think, okay, so it's not part <laughs> of work, but if I see it in leadership development and then when I have a performance review of my boss, we talk about those same competencies, when we look to hire people, is say, that makes a huge difference. It, it, it does. We're very fond of the idea that um, people don't need to be put into artificial situations and circumstances to, to learn to practice some of these leadership concepts. That their current job becomes a wonderful classroom. It's a great laboratory to practice collaboration, cooperation, uh, and so how you kind of build development activities into their current job is all about you know, what, what that, that fifth chapter kind of addresses. And the final one has to do with uh, the age old question about uh, sustainment, follow through. The single biggest criticism we hear uh, from participants in, in our, or any leadership development initiative is, well, the organization did this, and then we went back to work, and nothing more was said, nothing more was done, it got put up on the shelf, and it was nice, but nothing, n- no follow-up. Uh, so this final chapter addresses the importance of this issue and provides a r- number of recommendations about what organizations can do to provide ongoing sustainment uh, and follow through for their development efforts. And we try to give some very practical suggestions about what organizations are doing. Uh, and we, we think that that is one of the, uh, one of the, the big opportunities for more making these investments truly pay off for the company. That's part two. Joe, part, part three. 
Well, I was just going to say on this slide, Jack, that, that one of the things I'm really excited about is, uh, in our with our current 360, uh, that people we have the opportunity to come back and do this pulse assessment uh, after just three months, where they they don't do the whole 360. They just ask up to six questions, and they can do that with three, four, five months out, just to get a quick insight into you know are my efforts paying off here am i am i moving forward on this it, you know the more of that kind of sustainment we're really trying to do that uh, with our folks we we did an article uh, i i guess oh, five six years ago 2012 uh, and and we looked at men versus women <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know what we're, we're we're dealing here with some very large numbers about 40,000 men 22,000 women you know it's about twice as many men as women in our database but what we found is is there's a statistically significant difference and you look at those two two I mean the graph looks pretty big but it, it the males are at 49th percentile but women are at the 53rd percentile uh, and and when you look at that you go my gosh women are they come out on average as 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 being more effective leaders than men and that's surprising to 50 percent of the population <laughs> <laughs> well you know what's funny about this top topic joe is that many many years ago when i was doing some work with tom peters on one occasion he kind of turned to me and he said you know jack i I really do, in my heart of hearts, believe that women are better leaders than men. And I've never forgotten that comment because he said it without any data. He, it was, he was purely observing his experience. But it was interesting that when we looked at the data, he was right. <laughs> he was. And so we found that. And, and it, it, when you look at that and you kind of break it out and you, you sort of say, well, where does this come from? Uh, if you look at you know is it supervisors and it, it not no it's it, it as you move up the 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 uh the organization what you see is the biggest differences that uh, come in in sort of the senior management but even in the top management you can see a big difference in the ratings of women versus men and and again top management 53rd percentile and then and in senior management and middle management, the supervisors, it's pretty close. So you can see those differences, you know, up the, up, up the, uh, up the organization. And when you look at, uh, this is, uh, you know, 16 competencies here, you can see that 13 competencies where women uh, exceed those of men. And, and initially, one of the uh, theories that we heard over and over again is, well, yes, women are going to, they're going to be better on, on the interpersonal kinds of things, on, on the soft skills. Um, the interpersonal skills and, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nurturing competencies. Right. And, and, but yet when you looked at the number one, and I, I just think this is fascinating, the number one competency where, where women exceed men is on taking initiative. That is not a nurturing competency. <laughs> <laughs> I remember mm. uh, telling my wife, she came to me and she said, uh, the roof's leaking. And I looked at her and said, well, maybe it'll fix itself. <laughs> <laughs> when in the history of the world has a roof ever fixed itself? Mm. And so I went to work and she got on the phone and called a roofer. I don't know. But, but I, I see that a lot in, in, in women just taking the lead and jumping on it. The second one practices self-development. Their willingness to ask for feedback and respond to feedback and making changes based on that feedback. And then drive for results. You can see that's number three, uh, integrity and honesty. All those, 13 of the 15, I should mention that men are, uh, score better on two. And, and one of them, uh, I think, uh, raises uh, the eyebrows a little bit on, on strategic perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, I think there's a little more inclination men have towards that. But they score better on strategic perspective and on technical expertise. And, 
and innovates, uh, there's not a statistical difference. So uh, we find that fascinating, and and one of the things that we've also looked into is is um, how effective uh, leadership development demands measurement. And one of the things that we, we, we did a study on, we, we looked at three organizations where they've uh, asked people, uh, or where they assign people to be, uh, assign people as high potentials. And, uh, you know, what, what's the definition of a high potential, Jack? It's, Top 5%, you know, something you know, that, someone that really is capable of moving up and <clears throat> becoming one of your senior executives in time. So in theory, what you'd say is, well, they should clearly be in the top quartile at least. Maybe the t certainly <laughs> the top decile. They should absolutely be excelling. And and what we found when we looked at the 360 assessments we'd gathered is that 12 percent of those <laughs> leaders were actually in the bottom quartile. 30 percent were in the second quartile. 36 percent were in the third. Only 22 percent were actually in the top quartile. And now, here's the interesting thing. We, we uh, had three different organizations when we studied this. And in two of the organizations, uh, the, the 360 feedback was not shared with the manager and it was, it was confidential. In the third organization, the manager got a copy of the 360. Um, and they used that in a, in a strongly developmental way but in that organization, only 4.5% of their people were in the bottom quartile. And so what we started to see from that is the value of not only using the 360 for personal development, but in some organizations, we're, we're helping people understand who are your high potential leaders, who are your best leaders. We feel that 360 assessment is one of the best indicators of potential. And again, we've got to make it developmental and we've got to make the whole process developmental. Well, these are just a few of our insights, Jack. What, what's our conclusion? Yeah, so just uh, a final comment that that final uh, portion of the book also contains a chapter on, on teams and team development uh, that we think will be useful to you readers who uh, would like to kind of have a little more insight into maybe the importance of doing our development not just with individuals one at a time, but with individuals uh, in a team context. In conclusion, we would just maybe make these observations. Uh, leadership has been shrouded with this woo-woo uh, quality uh, that drives our desire to make something that is kind of mysterious, much less baffling. Obviously, many more books on leadership will be written, and they will help to push the study and, and the understanding of leadership attributes and leadership development to the next rung on the ladder by removing some of that mystery. And we certainly hope that this new uh, extraordinary leader book will go a, a long way uh, to making that happen. Thanks for joining us on today's webinar. And Joe, you've got some final comments that you'd well, like to make. You know, we love feedback. <laughs> so there's a, there's a little uh, assessment that we'd like you to take. Uh, we have an incentive uh, that comes with the assessment and there'll be a drawing for 10 uh, of these new books that we're gonna send out to folks. And plus, we have an ebook on on this particular webinar. Now you can uh, do this, and you can see now a, a site this bit.ly/zfnovember19. Now uh, that's all lowercase. It is case sensitive, and so we invite you to give us some feedback to tell us what you think, and and also fill out that survey and be registered to receive these, these books. Uh, we're excited about the book. We think it can be a real benefit for you, and I'm so glad it's done. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just gave Jack another book yesterday. <laughs> anyway, it's great to thank you so much. And any comments or any questions, we'd love, love you to talk to us. Thanks so much.